Is Sean Payton asking for too much money? And why D'Amico Ryan should be the best candidate that the Houston Texans could benefit from? You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Friday episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On NFL. It's Friday. I'm John Hickman. This is Cody Davis. We're straight to your face with all of the Texan talk during this offseason, the mm. ups and downs, and the right now what the hell, Sean Payton? <laughs> Sorry, twenty million dollars for a head coach. That's wide receiver money. And last time I checked, <laughs> Sean Payton ain't no wide receiver. Sean Payton ain't no journeyman quarterback. Sean Payton mm. is a coach. He's a very valuable coach, nonetheless. And I think that he's a coach that can sell himself. I get it. I understand. But twenty million dollars for four years. <laughs> <laughs> when, by the way, the Houston Texans already still have to pay David Cully and Lovey Smith, who's on their payroll. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a big fat in the New Orleans way. Hell no, baby. I don't understand <laughs> it. I love it. I love it. And John, as you alluded to over the last couple of days, uh, we had an opportunity to learn what is Sean Payton's asking price? And not only that, the New Orleans Saints asking price, and they place a very high demand on their former head coach. And for those of you guys who don't know, the New Orleans Saints are asking for not only a first round pick, but also a second round pick. Not only is Sean Payton asking for $25 million over a four-year span, look, I'm not about to sit here and count the Magnair's money. I, I'm pretty sure that not they can afford it. it. I'm pretty not sure they can, they, can, they can afford it if they really wanted to. However, the one thing that has really turned me off was the fact that he's asking for a short – term deal and when i take a look at the fact that this is an organization that's about to draft hopefully their next franchise quarterback rather that be bryce rather that be cj i want to see the houston texans whoever they hire as head coach i want to see them partner their franchise quarterback with a head coach that they could develop under and play under for at least the next eight to ten years and that is very important because in terms of young talent young promising talent i think too many people don't understand how much stability is important for these young guys to actually reach the potential that they have and look i cover two dysfunctional franchises here in the city of houston and neither one of those franchises have given their young players the the the, the stability and the coaching that they need in order to help these young guys get to the potential and when I take a look at Bryce when I and when I take a look at CJ, I don't want to see the Houston Texans put themselves in a position where they give up some valuable draft capital. Not only that, you also got to take into consideration that it could potentially be for only four years. What about you? You never know what those draft capital, what those draft picks can actually turn into. That might be somebody that you can pair alongside with your next franchise quarterback that can help the Houston Texans dominate not just the AFC South, but the entire league for the next 10 years or whatever the case might be. So there's a lot that the Texans should take into consideration into whether or not they want to bring in Sean Payton. Once again, Saints fan from New Orleans. He's going to be one of, if not my favorite NFL coach of, of all time. But like I've been saying a lot on the show, from the from the track record that he has, from the fact that he's asking for a short-term deal with a lot of money, and the fact that you got to give us some valuable um, draft capital in return, I, I don't think that it's worth the risk. I'm not mad at four years. I think four years is a uh, it's kind of standard between four to five years. When you get a new head coach, not an extension coming in, fresh of the well, you also got to keep in mind that I think he's 58, 59, 60, somewhere in the ballpark. I believe he's 59. Oh. 
He ain't got um, that much longer to be 10 years like how I want to see the next Texans head coach. Well, no, and I get, get it, but four years, I'm not mad at it. It's, I'm not paying a coach $20 million per year. I'm just not doing it. Uh, I, I don't have anything really in thoughtful, uh, you know, to say. I just think that it's a bad decision. I'm going to invest $100 million into you. And also what I would like to invest into you whenever you actually get to the team, I got to pay that cost for you to be the boss. And then I'm also losing out on what could actually help you uh, during your short-term tenure. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not mad at four, but I am – I'm looking at $100 million and I'm thinking to myself, is this something that was put out there to increase Sean Payton's bidding war? Is this something that was put out there to increase the, the, the likelihood of maybe some of these teams that are not ready to go in the direction of Sean Payton for them to back off a little bit like the Houston Texans? I don't know. I just think that number alone is absurd. It's insane to me. And I think when you hear that, again, comparing losing <laughs> out on the first and a second round pick, the smart decision, the smart business decision is to say, thank you, uh, I will move on. We will go with the next best candidate who we deem to be the next best candidate for our franchise. And then you have the uh, quote unquote dysfunction, dysfunction on Zoom. You can feel that. So. <laughs> I think the pipe dream, and at one point it was realistic to some people, mm -hmm. but the dream of Sean Payton coming to Houston, you got to ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth, you know, having to pay, if I'm a front office guy, having to pay three coaches in one year? Is it worth And that that's maybe $30 million, 30 to $35 million in one year, if he's going to get paid $20 million, <laughs> Is it worth losing out on that much money? For me, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll, I'll slam the book on it and I'm done with it. No. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know sometimes success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with the people who has the skills, values, and experience to help you achieve your goal. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract the qualified candidates to your opening jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data, data and by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to help you post your job in front of the most qualified candidates. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based off your job qualifications all on one, one platform. So LinkedIn Jobs, again, they help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL terms and conditions apply. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday installment of Locked On Texans. A big Friday here for the Houston Texans because whenever you guys hear this podcast, the Houston Texans may they may be in the middle or they might just be done doing their Zoom interview with. San Francisco 49ers defensive coordinator, D'Amico Ryans. John, when I take a look at D'Amico as a candidate for the Houston Texans, out of all the candidates, I do believe that the Texans might benefit the most from hiring him as their next head coach. Um, and there's four things that I'm looking at. First and foremost, um, you're talking about D'Amico Ryans, one of the most beloved players in franchise history. Um, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I truly do believe you cannot make a list. Top 10 might be pushing it, but you can you damn sure can't make a top 15 list of best players and most beloved players in franchise history. And you cannot name D'Amico Ryans. Why is that important? Because over the last, what, two to three years, we have seen this organization kind of struggle with the connect between them and their fan base and i do believe that you're i think have... d'amico may be five 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 i i, I uh, thought top jj be... jj andre 
A lot well, of fans still love DeAndre Hopkins. A lot of fans love Arian Foster. And I, I think that five would go between D'Amico, Brian Cushing, and uh, mm. uh, maybe Kareem. But I, I, I think, yeah, I think five is up for debate for D'Amico. And you and you might be right, you know. Um, like I said, I thought 10 was pushing it, but you know, but what you just said, that's just showcase how much love and appreciation he still has here in the city of Houston. And like I just mentioned, this is a franchise that has been struggling with that connect with their fan base, and you're gonna have a lot of people saying, you know what, I'm about to start rooting for the Houston Texans again, only because I want to see D'Amico Ryans succeed as a head coach. The next thing that I'm looking at, look. D'Amico Ryans, not only is he one of the most beloved players in franchise history, but one of the best. During his time, he was not only a pro bowler, but he was an all-pro linebacker. And that is very important because in the first segment, I talked about how important it is for young players to have stability. And when you take a look at this Houston Texans linebacking core ever since what? 2018 2019 with Whitney Mer Merciless finish somewhere in the ballpark of like eight to nine sacks that was the last time the Houston Texans linebacking court was good to say the least over the last couple of years they have been subpar at best now I'm looking at two linebackers I feel that can truly benefit from learning from the De from D'Amico from not only as a coach but also as a player who played at a very high level for not just the Texans, but in this league. And the two players that I'm looking at is Jake Hansen and Christian Harris. I think Jake in this rookie season, he has showcased the ability to be at least a quality linebacker in this league or starting linebacker in this league. And I know it's early. You might look at me when I, you might look at me crazy when I say this, but in the short amount of time that we've seen Christian Harris, given everything that he has gone through, I do believe that he possessed the qualities to be a Pro Bowl linebacker in this league one day. That's just me. I, I was very impressed from what he showcased as a rookie. And, of course, what I'm looking at is the fact that as a defensive-minded coach, he's definitely going to orchestrate an offense that's going to improve the Houston Texans defense that has been god-awful over the last two to three seasons. And all you have to do is just – Take a look at the numbers between what the San Francisco 49ers did this year and what the Houston Texans did this year as well. Points per game. The 49ers gave up 16 and a half points. The Houston Texans, 24 and a half points. <laughs> yards on the ground. The San Francisco 49ers gave up an average of 77 yards on the ground. The Houston Texans, 170. <laughs> you know, and there's more numbers I can do to showcase the difference between a defensive led San Francisco 49ers being led by D'Amico Ryans as a defensive coordinator versus what the Houston Texans had to go through over the last few years. And another thing that I'm looking at, and I don't think that this get brought, brought up enough in terms of defensive coordinators who are seeking their, their first head coaching job. When we look at offensive coordinators, um, like for Ben Johnson, for an example, when you look at an offensive coordinator, the one thing everybody wants to say, well, did he call the plays? Did he call the plays? Did he orchestrate the offense? Like, what did he do? Or he's just a benefit from the head coach. Who is the San Francisco 49ers head coach? Kyle Shanahan, right? One of the best offensive-minded geniuses in today's game. I'm pretty sure without a shadow of a doubt that everything that we see the San Francisco 49ers do on the defensive side of the ball is coming from D'Amico Ryan. So when you factor all of that in, I think the Houston Texans can benefit the most from D'Amico as their head coach. They literally have nothing to lose. Listen, I am – I don't care about D'Amico, the former Texan. And I think a lot of people do, right? And I can't I can't blame him because you are as a fan, give me a reason to come to the games. Give me a reason to support. Well, the best reason to support is just hiring the best candidate out there. Mm -hmm. And when I look at D'Amico Ryan's in the past two seasons, as D'Amico Ryan's as the coordinator. The San Francisco 49ers ranked second in the NFL in points allowed uh, and yards allowed, 18.9 points allowed, uh, right above 305 yards allowed, fourth in def in uh, defensive, defensive efficiency at 60.7 and yards per play, 5.4, and fifth in defensive EPA at 
oh two. I don't care about what he did when he was drafted and when he won the rookie of the year for Houston. I don't care about any of that when he was a beloved Texan player, when he wore the red, white, and blue before being traded to Philly. If D'Amico Ryans gets the job, it won't be because you're going to parade him out as a former Texan. It's going to be because you're going to parade him out as one of the best defensive young minds in the NFL. Let's get that straight. And I wanted to express that personally because I've seen, and I'm not necessarily saying that you're doing it because, Cody, you – separated it like this is why he's considered when you give those numbers right my only concern with D'Amico is who's going to be his offensive coordinator now we can look at Clint Kubiak Kubiak also you know <laughs> son of former uh Houston Texan coach uh Gary Kubiak got his start with his dad in, in Denver uh this past year with the Denver Broncos once Hackett released and relinquished the play calling duties to Kubiak, it was a rough start for those first two games, but they ended the season averaging 25 points per game. So maybe that's somebody that he can bring in who, you know, want to fresh start, leave the Denver, uh, that, that franchise. And by the way, they will be looking for and hiring soon their own head coach. When you bring in a new head coach, they typically – bring in their own staff. Then I also look at Mike LaFleur, who he worked with between 2017 and 2022. Mike LaFleur just let go from the New York Jets, a hot name right now from the Rams. Well, why do I say Mike LaFleur? Mike LaFleur is from that Shanahan Kubiak tree where that offense just seems like no matter who you put in it, it can work. So the speculation of who's going to be the OC isn't something that I necessarily want to force and talk about, and I'd rather discuss it once we figure out who the next head coach will be, but the expectations of Ryan's will be who will he bring over to install some version of that Shanahan offense or close to it, which is why I gave those two names, and I'm pretty sure that there's other guys out there, uh, maybe like a Hackett and a thing Hackett who was fired from Denver as a head coach first year, but when he spent some time with Coach LaFleur in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, that offense was pretty damn potent to watch in uh, his two seasons with him. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, end up hearing Byron Leftwich as a name that can be brought up after he was scapegoated for the struggles of Tom Brady um, <laughs> and, and that offense in Tampa. But that's my concern right now because when I look at some of those coaches – on the staff offensively for the 49ers. Brian Greasy just started coaching. Uh, You know, they got some, they got some, some guys over there that, you know, maybe good at some of their coordinator, not coordinator, but some of their position coaches. But for Houston, you hired D'Amico. That's great. But they're also going to need somebody that can step in, install and not have to have their hands held in offense that can get this offense moving no matter who's behind center at quarterback. So that is a concern for me. And if D'Amico is brought and hired to be the Houston Texans next head coach, I am very interested to see, will he bring somebody from that staff that has some sort of knowledge of that Shanahan coaching style, uh, you know, how they do things in San Fran and how they've done things uh, typically where some of these play coaches have gone under that tree or will he step outside of the box and hire somebody else that he may see fit better for the job? And I'm glad that you brought that up because that goes hand-to-hand -hand into what are the Houston Texans going to value most, an offensive-minded coach or a defensive-minded coach? And in terms That's a great of – question. And, and, and there's something we got to get into later, well, probably one day next week. But you, you have to take into consideration – how bad this offense been over the last two seasons, the potential of drafting your next franchise quarterback and trying to mix all of that in with the likes of Damian Pierce. So, and of course, you know, improving the wide receiving core in terms of the defensive side, I think the defensive side might be better off than the offensive, than the offensive side of the ball only because I think there's um, more talent, but a lot of that talent has shown a lot of untapped potential, i.e. Derek Stingley. Um, i.e. John, Jonathan Grenard. So um, that, that's the conversation we should revisit next week. But um, in terms of all facets, 
I would say the Texans will benefit the most from D'Amico Ryans. And by the way, I do know he's going to get the most out of Derrick Singley. Speaking of Singley. <laughs> uh, I will say this. I always want to throw this out. Big plays during the 2022 NFL season offensively, the Houston Texans were bottom of the league with That's 84 always. big plays. I think when you look at this franchise mm. moving forward offensively, something's got to give. And I do believe, just kind of foreshadowing, that offensive coordinator should be realized, uh, should should be hired for the Knicks head coach. Listen, really quick, man, it is the new year, and a lot of us are still on our new year resolutions, in a sense, trying to conquer healthier living. Healthier living in terms of eating can get boring. I know it. Like, who wants to eat seaweed chips? Who wants to do that? Sometimes you got to spice it up and have a little bit of fun with your healthier eating, and that's where Bill Bar comes in. Bill Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. You can find them at your local Walmart or Sam's, Sam's Club. They have a lot of different flavors to, churro, to, to choose from. Listen, I'm ready to tell you. Churro, which is my favorite. Me and my wife love them in our house, so check out BillBar.com. Use promo code locked on 15 to get 15% off your next order. Look, guys, we're looking out for you. 15% off online at billbar.com. If you're not an online shopper, you can even beat that and go directly to Walmart or Sam's Club. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, before this Friday installment of Locked On Texans. And Larry Tussle said he is enjoying the NFL offseason. His offseason, as a matter of fact, for those of you guys who don't know, um, Larry Tussle had an opportunity to take the first shot at the Houston Rockets game. Unfortunately, the game that they lost to the Charlotte Hornets that extended their losing streak to 12. Yes, I know. But. That's probably one of the best things of the night, watching an offensive lineman go up there and knock down a free throw with ease. Um, after it was over, we had an opportunity to speak to Laramie Tonsil. I did not know this. Fun fact, Laramie Tonsil was a hooper for, he said, all the way up until his senior year of high school. And that's they, told, they probably told him he football. can't play basketball no more. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, oh, Funny thing, by the way, um, Kyle McNair and Hannah McNair was also in the building, and Kyle McNair was was giving him tips on how to hold his follow through after he released the free throw shot, and he also said if he missed, just go ahead and dunk it. Which you know, I don't think that would have been a good idea for Larry Tonsil to attempt a dunk because had he had he slipped and failed, then yeah, that would not be look that would not look good. But you know, going back to Larry Tonsil and his quote unquote basketball career, he also said he played AAU, which I did not know. I thought that was very interesting. But um, one of the main who, who the why, hell who the hell <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was trying to hold it in. Cal McNair was giving tips on athletics. Yeah, yeah. He he even told us. He he All told right. me, Sarge, and Mark Berman that he told him after you shoot it, hold your follow through so you can make it. That that's what he told us. And Laramie Tonsil confirmed it. So who knows? Who, who so knows? so Cal McNair <laughs> hold your fo- see Cal McNair. He wouldn't have been at UC at USC if somebody <laughs> didn't get. Pre- I'm sorry. Loving basketball reference. Going back to Laramie Tunsil, you know, Laramie Tunsil had a phenomenal season, um, was ranked as one of, if not the best left tackle in the game today. Unfortunately, um, he, he made the Pro Bowl list, but he did not make all the all pro list, which I think that is truly unacceptable, regardless of what the Houston Texans did this season. He was by far if not the best, the second best left tackle in the game this past season. However, and a couple of weeks ago, our good friend DJ Bienemy over at ESPN reported that Laramie Tunsil wants to be the highest paid left tackle in the game today. Um, as of right now, one year left on his contract, Laramie Tunsil has somewhere in the ballpark between 20 to $22 million left on his deal. John, do you think this is something that Nick Asirio and the Houston Texans should consider? In my opinion, I would say yes, because... I think, like I've been mentioning, you want to put your rookie quarterback in the best situation as possible. And, you know, and that starts with 
the best version of, of your offensive line, the best version of the Houston Texans offensive line means Larry Tunsil is still holding down on that left side. Yeah, they got the money to do it, right? Um, and, you know, once once they hire a new head coach, you know, they'll see how much they value Larry Tunsil out there. And I think that Larry Tunsil should be valued uh, pretty high for this franchise, pretty high for any franchise, right? The funny thing about Larry Tunsil and the relationship between the Houston Texans is he's pretty much controlled it. It's, it's pretty much been one-sided. Um, whether he was blocking for uh, Deshaun Watson or Tyrod Taylor, David Smills, and, 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 you know, at times this year, Jeff Driscoll, Kyle Allen. Uh, he's been the brightest and best spot uh, offensively for Houston for, you know, for the past couple of seasons. And he controls his own destiny. He's he's it's, it's been one sided, but I, I think that he is valuable. Hmm. That's a lot of money to sink into him, and that's a lot of money to sink into a player. If you don't think that within the following year of getting that deal done, you are not making uh, 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 contending moves to at least compete to win your division to make a playoff push. So I think that that's where you would have to draw the fine line and say to myself, do I really want to sign them that much? We're still going to be in the rebuild mode in the next couple of seasons, or can I bite the bullet on that first year getting his contract done, and then that following year we look good enough to make a playoff push? Thank you guys for checking out today's episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast. We appreciate it. Make sure you follow us throughout the weekend. Like, comment, subscribe. Do all. Y'all know what to do on YouTube under the name Locked On Texans. Follow us on Twitter at Locked On Texan and follow me on Twitter as well at John underscore Hickman 12. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, it's Cody C O T Y D A V I S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.